Hi everybody, I'm Kent Martz. I'm Mark Scrocky. I'm Director of Business Development here at Alpen Optics. And I work in a customer service at Alpen Optics. Um, we're launching the On the Hunt podcast, sponsored by Alpen Optics. And uh, we're having a few def technical difficulties and we just decided to heck uh, with it. We're just going to go live and see what happens. So, Why not? Um, I've got a background in hunting. Uh, Mark has done some hunting, but we have with us Rick White. Uh, Rick, uh, tell us about yourself a little bit. Uh, introduce yourself and tell us what you do, because you're the you're the big time hunter among us. <laughs> well, yeah, you know I'm uh, Rick White, and uh, you know I've been hunting since uh, as far back as I can remember. I think I was about six years old when my when my dad first took me out, and uh, I had the great fortune of hunting with him over the years, and and my grandparents and some some relatives, and I just cut my teeth like any any other hunter did probably, and and uh but i just i did it as much as i possibly could and uh you know it evolved into a lot of different things over the years for me uh i hooked up with a with a major uh ma you know hunting manufacturing company and and did a lot of tv on the outdoor channel sportsman's channel and on and on and on a lot of videos over the years uh, i've been in turkey calling competitions over the years and have done real well and Anyways, I, I'm just uh, I'm just a hunter uh, that, you know, I like to I like to hunt as much as just about anything. And uh, we like to go out and capture it on video and, and share it with uh, folks and uh, try to get uh, try to get those young kids involved with hunting. So that's uh, that's an important thing for me. You know, uh, Alpen has been a brand that, that this company has owned for a couple of years now. And, you know, we constantly get calls from people uh, when they, who've had old Alpen products call us to ask us if uh, the warranty is still good. And yes, the warranty is still good. We are honoring uh, the, the Alpen uh, brand's warranty, uh, which was a lifetime warranty. And people are amazed that we're doing that. And that was a decision the ownership made uh, when they bought the Alpen brand back in um, 2016, uh, 2018, that uh, we were gonna honor that warranty. And basically in 2018, when we bought Alpen, we got, I've been telling people three things. The name of Alpen, uh, the warrant, the uh, the website, and the warranty. We got no products or anything else. And so um, Alpen was a company that had been around since uh, uh, the 1996 when a guy named Tim Gardner, Gardner, uh, former uh, Bushnell executive, uh, started the company, and has great great brand loyalty. Uh, people love their Alpen optics. And uh, our ownership, uh, one of the factories had been manufacturing um, the uh, rifle scopes and uh, binoculars for Alpen. And after uh, uh, Tim closed the company down, uh, they saw an opportunity to go ahead and uh, continue the line. And so uh, since then, we have uh, completely revamped the line and done some pretty cool stuff with the, with the binoculars. Mark, why don't you explain some of what we've, what we've done? I think that if you look at the uh, the breadth of the Alpen line, it's a little bit different than what it used to be back in the 1990s and the 2000s. Uh, always, always great product. We hear so many stories. Uh, I'm the guy that's most on the phone with Alpen, uh, Alpen customers and Alpen consumers. And we hear things like the original green binocular. We hear great optics. We hear fantastic stuff for the money. And we love hearing that. But we got a really cool story since we acquired this company and the assets of the company in 2018. And that's that we spent all of 2019 developing a brand new product line. And what's come out at the end of the tunnel is two new series of rifle scopes, about four new spotting scopes, and five new series of binoculars. And we're looking forward to sharing a little bit uh, about that over the course of these shows with everybody. and. I'm going to talk about uh, the product line just a little bit, not too much. We mainly want to talk about hunting and hunting, stuff like that. Hunting and fishing but and getting the outdoors and all that fun stuff. We also want to talk to you about uh, an opportunity to engage with some of this product, and I'll I'll talk about that a little bit later in the. Yeah, towards the, the end, we're going to the people listening to the broadcast and the podcast are going to have the ability to uh, um, pick up a pair of some very nice binoculars uh, with a pretty good deal. But you know, the whole point of this is lifestyle and lifestyle around around being in the outdoors and uh, hunting and fishing and, and the things that go uh, with this passion that we all have. Um, and, and Rick and I and Mark had been talking last couple of days and we thought we might as well start out, we were talking about the differences 
we're in northwest Arkansas and Rick's in uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And we thought, why not, let's talk about the differences in styles of hunting between where we live. And so Rick, talk about what you do right now and, and what you're faced with, with hunting in Iowa. And then I think you've got a trip come up to, up to Indiana that allows you to, to change tactics a little bit with weaponry. Right, right. you know, our, our archery season, uh, you know, our rut hits uh, pretty much like the Midwest, the first three weeks in November. But our, uh, our bow season's just about out, the first part of the bow season anyways. Our first gun season opens this weekend, this coming weekend. And then we have a, a second gun season that opens up the following weekend. And in Iowa, uh, primarily it's been a shotgun only deer hunting state when it comes to guns. However, in the last couple of years, they've now allowed straight wall rifles. Uh, so... You know, our hunting is a little bit different than some of the other states uh, that might allow uh, centerfire rifles and that kind of thing. But uh, our hunting here, uh, you know, our guns are effective out to, you know, 200 yards and less, I would say, on average. And um, so, you know, the optics that I use on my guns is probably different than what most people are putting on, uh, say, the 30 out sixes and things like that. Uh, I have not personally, I, I have shot a couple of deer with a 450 Bushmaster, a straight wall rifle, but uh, most uh, most of my hunting is still done with a shotgun. I'm, uh, I'm an old shotgun hunter uh, from years back and, you know, that's what I do. And, and, you know, when we're talking optics and we're talking scopes and that kind of thing, uh, what I use on my 200 yard and in type guns are are more low power. You know, you don't need that high power. One to four, or two to six is, is perfectly adequate. And that's what I like uh, on my guns, you know, if you, and, and I always tell people just put on your gun, what you, what you like. Uh, if you want a higher power uh, and your eyes aren't as good, that's, that's perfectly okay, but you really don't need it to be honest with you. So you're shooting out to 200 yards with a rifle barrel or are you shooting a straight shotgun? No, I'm using a rifled barrel. Uh, you know, when I started shotgun hunting in Iowa years ago, I was, uh, I shot my first deer in Iowa when I was 12 years old, which uh, was back in the seventies. I, not to give my age away, but, uh, uh, you know, we weren't allowed to use rifled barrels back then. And we shot smooth bore, or actually when we first started, we didn't even have slug barrels. Uh, we were shooting just our standard, uh, bird, you know, bird barrels and that kind of thing. And, and, uh, we never even paid attention to what kind of choke. I can't tell you how many slugs I've shot out of a, out of a full choke. And, and, uh, certainly that's not recommended nowadays, but, uh, you know, then smooth bores came along and, and they shot okay, but rifled slug barrels will get you that 200 yard shot. Uh, a smooth bore will shoot 200 yards, but uh, the, the effect, uh, you know, the effective range uh, and your accuracy uh, drops drastically uh, when you're not shooting a rifled barrel. Well, down here in the Ozarks, you know, we're in the mountains and uh, uh, I think the, the, the farthest deer, deer I've ever taken a shot at and, 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 sh and shot at and killed was probably 75 yards max. Uh, but yet I'm shooting a, a, a Remington 270, um, you know, with a, a, um, uh, with a scope that's like a four to 12 or something like that. And it's probably overkill. You know, there's some power lines and uh, some, some areas you might be able to get a longer shot off, but most people around here are shooting pretty short shots. And, you know, you can get over in East Arkansas in the Delta along the Mississippi River and you can certainly take uh, some longer shots over there. I was a, a member of a, uh, a deer club in South Ar Southeast Arkansas for a number of years. Uh, we're in the pine, the pine woods and they would uh, be hunting over like 80 acres that had been clear cut and had been reseeded. And uh, you could uh, you know, take some pretty long shots uh, along some of those power lines and in those uh, four or five year old uh, reseeded uh, pine trees than the, they were just deer magnets. So, um, Mark, what have you hunted with? I've hunted with, um, wow, I've hunted out west a little bit. I'm more of a bird hunter ah. than, uh, than a large mammal hunter, but spent a couple of years, uh, shot uh, several pronghorn that were a lot of fun and a lot of chasing yeah. and yeah. a lot of uh, laying down on top of sage before you started to shoot. That was a lot of fun and was fortunate enough to take a couple of mule deer out there that I really enjoyed, but it's uh, I'm mainly a bird hunter. Yeah. That's, uh, that's my passion as far as hunting goes. I like to shoot ducks, uh, I like to walk. 
uh, behind a dog and and quail hunt. Mm -hmm. Did a lot of that when we lived in South Carolina. It was a lot, lot of fun, a lot of fun. And uh, the normal dove hunting and wherever I wind up doing that on, on opening day. Yeah. Um, the other option that we, we have and we haven't talked about is muzzle loading. I've muzzle loaded a little bit and, uh, uh, you know, don't, don't spend enough time with my smoke pole as I should, but uh, it's, uh, uh, I just go to the rifle. Uh, um, Rick, what kind of uh, uh, muzzle loading have you done? Well, I, I've done a lot of muzzle loader hunting. Uh, I go every year. In fact, I'm leaving uh, tomorrow. Heading to Indiana, as you mentioned, and, and it's their muzzleloader season starting Saturday. Uh, but I, I muzzleloader hunt a couple of states every year. And uh, actually, I'm going to hunt three this year with my muzzleloader. And I use, you know, as far as scopes go, I use the same scope setting. Because a muzzleloader, you know, virtually is 200 yards and in. Yeah, can you shoot them a little bit further? Yeah, some muzzleloaders you can. Uh, but most people aren't, you know, all that effective uh, unless they've got a good rest uh you know out to 200 yards but i can shoot out to 200 yards very efficiently with my gun and uh, i like the same scopes that i put on my shotgun they're, they're virtually shooting about the same distance and um yeah i mean i i, I love muzzleloader hunting it's uh it's a lot of fun you know the first time i remember going on my first muzzleloader hunt i didn't know anything about a muzzleloader and and you know i'm an old shotgun hunter like i said but uh, to be honest with you they're they're uh almost equal and uh and you know the amount of fun that you have and, and of course uh, the challenge that there is to any deer hunting certainly the technology has changed the muzzle loading a lot the uh, the, the first muzzle loader i shot was handmade uh, from a kit uh, one of my best friends did it and then used the old small caps and you know you'd pull the trigger and it'd go pop bang and it'd take you know that long is is you know old style gun and and it was a whole different style of shooting now with the uh, the guns you can open the breech on and 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 have pre-packed uh, 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 pellets of gunpowder. It just really has changed the 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 ability of of muzzle loading. And uh, I still do have an old uh, small cap uh, muzzle loader that I've thought about taking out a number of times and just haven't done it. I need to pull it out one of these days and and go out to the farm uh, late season when the deer is still uh, the does are still around and 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 try and. Uh, bring a doe in that way because it's been a while since I've done that. Uh, do you do much buck, bow hunting, Rick? I do a ton of bow hunting. Yeah, I bow hunt a lot. Um, probably, probably seventy-five percent of the time that I am hunting, I'm hunting with a bow. And I've been bow hunting since, uh, gosh, as long as I can remember. Mm -hmm. um, how important are optics when it comes to bow hunting for you? Well, I mean, versus rifle hunting. It, it, honestly, it doesn't matter what you're doing as far as hunting goes. They're, they're, they're always an important factor. Uh, you know, optics, you know, you can talk range finders, you can talk uh, binoculars, but when I'm, uh, binoculars are important even preseason. When I'm out scouting, that's, that's the biggest time of the year that I like to use my optics uh, because I want to figure out what I've got in a given area, uh, what they're doing, what they're feeding on, where they're bedding, all that. And, and optics help you a lot with that. But, you know, even when you're just hunting, um, me specifically, I like to go after a, one of a few deer that I've got, uh, you know, pictures of and that kind of thing. So I want to make sure that I'm shooting the right deer. I'm, I'm shooting mature deer. Now, of course, anybody out there hunting can shoot whatever they, they want, and that's perfectly okay. But, uh, I, you know, I look at a lot of different things. But optics are great. Helps you with your scouting. Uh, hey, it helps you with just being able to enjoy nature. I mean, watching a squirrel or watching a woodpecker or whatever it might be, uh, good optics will let you just bring the outdoors that much closer to you. So, uh, you, you know, there's always a use for good optics. You know, I love it when you get up in a tree stand and you've been there for 30 minutes before sun, sunrise and, and the world is starting to wake up around you and you're part of the woods. You just become part of the forest around you. And I've literally sat in a tree stand all day long and just enjoyed the whole day up there and you know had squirrels climb across the tree stand chipmunks come up and sit on my leg um i had chipmunks start to go up my pants leg one day that made me jump a little bit uh i have had a gray fox walk up and smell my foot when i was sitting sitting on the ground uh was it's that, just uh kent was that the inside of your pant legs or the outside of your it was pant it legs? was well he started up Pant leg, and I pretty right. well got up when he okay. started up that right. pant leg, because okay. that was quite a shock that he was going in. Yeah, that wasn't fun. Um, 
but uh, and luckily there was no deer around. But if there were, I didn't really care at that point. Oh. You know, um, but that's what I love about it is is getting out and and just the woods just accepting you as part of the environment around them. And I'm sure Rick, you experienced that too, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, if 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 anybody out there is a hunter they're going to tell you that it's not just about going out and shooting an animal. I mean, that's just icing on the cake, but it's the camaraderie of, of hunting with your buddies. Or it's the stories that you get to tell. It's the experiences you get to experience that that's what hunting's all about. You know, it's, it's just coming home, you know, especially with all the stuff that's going on in the world these days. I mean, it's the, it's the only place that I can go out and, you know, and, and really enjoy myself. So, uh, I, you know, I recommend everybody go out and try it. Yeah. You're talking about my, my wife's grandfather, uh, would go deer hunting and he's the one that got me in going to the deer club down in South Arkansas. He'd been a part of since like the late thirties. And, um, he would kill a deer every time he went out and how he did it was he would go out and he'd see a deer and he'd hold the rifle up and go bang, literally say bang. And then he'd sit there for a while and he'd pack up and go back to the deer club, you know, and get something to eat. Cause you know, he just, he just enjoyed exactly like you said, be around with these guys that he'd grown up with and their kids and grandkids and just that joy of just being out in the woods. And he would literally, you know, only shoot a deer with, by, with sound and then just finally pack up and come home. Um, we were talking about safety a little bit and that we talked about talking about safety and talking about Mosolo and I had a good friend uh, years ago, uh, was a policeman, Mr. Gun Safety. You know, grew up in Boy Scouts with him, and he was gun safety guy. And he had been going out to a friend's to go muzzleloading, and uh, it was raining the next day, and so he decided that he wasn't going to hunt that day. He'd go tomorrow. Well, he forgot about it, and you know, the next fall he went out to uh, and his muzzleloader. This is an old style gun, with couldn't open the breach, and he didn't want to have to shoot it and get the slug out or the ball out, and so he just left it loaded. So he went back uh, that fall to a gun range and was going to blow the cobwebs out and put a cap in it, popped it, nothing, put another cap in it, popped it, nothing, did that four or five times. And Mark, Mr. Gun Safety, and, and shows you how quickly things can go bad. He thought, there's got to be something coming out of the end of this thing. And he put his finger over the end of it just like that, popped another cap off, and he lost his tip of his finger about like that. And I said, Mark, what did that feel like? And he said, take a piece of like paracord and wrap a slip knot around your finger. Stand with your arm like that. Have a motorcycle about 200 yards of that string and have them take off as fast as they can. And you just stand there and wait for that thing to get tight. And he said, that's what it felt like. And uh, uh, Mr. Gun Safety, and uh, uh, he, let, he had enough still, so he still can pull a trigger with his left hand. But it just shows how quickly something can go wrong and as safe as you are. And it's, we, I continually think and, and raise my kids to pay attention to safety out in the woods. Uh, if I'm going hunting, I take a fanny pack with me that's got a first aid kit, it's got food, and, and I hunt on 100 acres, you know, and it's, a, not, it's nothing dangerous unless I fall out of a tree, but I still want to be prepared to spend a night out in the woods just in case I have to. And if I'm going hunting, I always have that with me. Just, you know, I always have my, my pocket knife, but I've got all, everything I need to really, you know, at least survive by myself for a little while. Rick, what, do you do that too? Or how do you handle uh, yeah, safety like let that? Let me talk a little bit about safety. And, and I, as I do seminars throughout the United States, that's probably the most important thing that I talk about. 80% of hunting related uh, incidents involve people falling out of their tree stands. So we'll, 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 we'll talk about that in just a moment. So the other 20% uh, are, are all the other things that happen. And you know, you hear from time to time people that are getting shot and that kind of thing. That just right there goes to show you how much more important optics are because uh, make sure you know what you're shooting at. And if you can't see it well, a uh, good pair of binoculars will tell you what you're shooting at. So, you know, think about that. Now, safety when you're going to the woods, two things that I always like to carry. And one is a knife and you'd mentioned that. And the other is a cell phone. Because if you're hunting by yourself and, and you have any problems, you want to be able to be able to contact someone else. Now, Tree stand hunting, uh, the, again, the biggest part uh, are, are people falling out of their tree stands. Most of those folks that fall out of tree stands are falling while they're climbing up or climbing down out of their stand. 
Um, so, you know, you can think about that a little bit. Now, there's so many different products on, on the market. I, I like uh, a product that Hunter Safety System actually sells. It's called a Lifeline. And I started putting them in every one of my tree stands. And if you'll put them in your tree stand, and they're not that expensive, everybody ought to have them in every tree stand. You, when you're hooked up to them, you cannot fall out of your tree, whether you're climbing up, climbing down, or in your tree stand. And right there would take care of 80% of hunting related incidents, just right there by itself. How does that work? Is it, is it like a, does, is it a line that goes from top to bottom and you have like a, a Jumar ascender on it so you can slide up it or how does that work? That's exactly right. You have a carabiner clip, you got a line that goes above your stand and then it ties to the bottom and it's got a slip knot uh, rope on it with a carabiner that you clip into the back of your vest. And as you go up, you just slide it up the tree and if you fall off, you know, you're not falling any further. You're not going to fall to the ground and you just keep sliding up till you get in your stand and then you're locked in. I mean, it's, it's that simple. And there, there's no, and listen, I talk to people all the time that still don't even wear a safety restraint. Uh, so listen, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell the people that are watching right now, uh, if you're not going to do it for yourself, do it for your loved ones. It's that important to them. Yeah. It should be that important to you. You know, I had a, uh, start out bow hunting. And, and, and from a tree and those old chokers, it was just a loop you put around the tree and then a loop you put around. And I always thought, dude, if you fall out of a tree with one of those things, it's gonna be painful. And it, you're gonna, the angle, you can't get out of it. Every time you exhale, it's gonna get tighter and tighter and tighter. And those things really, it might keep you from falling on the ground, but it might strangle you up in the tree. And those scared me. And I remember the first time I saw a lineman's harness I bought that thing. I didn't care how much it was. That lineman's harness that comes up through your legs and has a, 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 a thing in the back and, a, and came with a, a cord cutter so you could cut yourself out if you needed to. That was, was a game changer for me and feeling much more comfortable in a tree. Um, but what always scares me is that transition. If you're climbing up a stick and onto a, 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 a permanent platform, is that transition from the stick off to the platform. Because I kept putting it as high as I could get it above the ladder. And I'd climb up the ladder and then hold on to the tree and then step over. And finally one day, the, 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 the adult in me finally figured out, let's put it about four feet lower so you can still hold on to that ladder and step off onto the, onto the platform. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, it still scares me to, to this day. And I, I make sure I'm hooked in because, you know, 12 feet, I don't want to fall 12 feet. I have a friend that did. In fact, we ought to have him on the show sometime because he uh, uh, climbed an old tree stand and, and it collapsed with him. And the story about what happened after that is an impressive story. So anyway, we're uh, starting to run out of time. And the rest of the shows, we're gonna have people coming in with uh, uh, other backgrounds, hunting in other parts of the country, talking about their lifestyle and what they do, what they do from food plots to squirrel hunting to fishing. We're gonna have a good time on the show tell a lot of stories. We look forward to feedback with everybody. Um, you know, so we're gonna be uh, giving you some, some ways to contact us. Mark, you got some product to talk about I'm here. up, I'm up, Ken. Yeah, I talked about a few things that we've done to change the product line in Alpen uh, while we were sort of dormant in 2019, right after the acquisition in 2018. And one of the things that we did was redesign a lot of the product. and. It's, uh, it's not the perfume on the pig redesign, it's meaningful redesign. And I, I just wanted to uh, show you guys one example today. Uh, probably during 2018, prior to us uh, acquiring Alpen, best-selling binocular series inside the Alpen was a series called Shasta Ridges. And really, really nice binoculars. I don't know if you can get on, in on this or how you set going on. It's yeah, beautiful it's on the camera. So best-selling series of binoculars, around $200 at retail. And we came into the picture and we said, what do we want to do? Do we just want to keep continuing to uh, make the same binocular that Alpen's made for years, or do we have an opportunity to do something different? Well, we did something different, and it's really, really nice the way it turned out. Consumers are responding to this binocular, and we're, re we're really happy about it. I'm going to put them side by side here, and they're the same binocular, both 8x42s both Shasta ridges, but the first thing that you'll see when you get a look at both these is this one's about 20%, 15-20% smaller than the original binocular. It's uh, 
got some really aggressive design on it, but functionally, it's a lot better too. It's got uh, some different prism coating systems. We're using dielectric coating on the prisms for the first time with Shasta ridges. But the biggest difference with these things is when you pick them up. This thing is about 20% lighter than the original Shasta ridge. Um, we have really stepped it up in the body design. Uh, we're using a magnesium frame on this, magnesium tubes, magnesium uh, fittings, and it makes it about 20% lighter than the old one. And they're priced about the same. Still waterproof? Still fully waterproof. This guy will go down to, uh, without any problems, down to 10 meters for upwards of an hour and not have okay, anything so, go on with it. So we're going to do an episode from the dive shop and we're going to get Mark down in the in the 20 foot deep pool yeah. with the binoculars, using the binoculars. That'll be a great show right there. Get my best bathing suit, yep. my Alpen bathing suit on and we'll go for yep, it. Yeah, we're going to have some fun with that. Yes, sir. The other thing that's pretty cool about these binoculars is they uh, now come with a lens pen, which is a really, really nice tool. You've got a dirty lens, hit it with the brush, Initially, if you really have smudges or whatnot, you go to the other side and it's got a little foam cleaning tool with a little bit of solution. So, Does it have a puffer on it? A little air puffer? Or is it's it just a brush? A, just a brush. You are the air puffer. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, yeah it's, <laughs> it's able to remain clean and squeaky so, clean. And we got a great offer that Kent's going to tell you about. No, you tell him about it. You I'll got, tell him about you it. Tell him about it. You're the here. one that came up with it. Yeah, so as part of this... Uh, series of uh, streams. We want to give you guys an opportunity to uh, buy some stuff at a great price. So through the weekend, I think it runs through midnight on Sunday. If you go to the BresserUSA.com site and pull up the new Shasta Ridges, you'll see the old ones next to the new ones. You'll see them side by side. And um, on the new ones, two models, the 392 and 394s, 50% off the uh, price that's on the site. So they're up for, I think, $279 on the site. So you can pick them up for about $140 if you want to, uh, if you don't believe me how good they are and you have to see them for yourselves. It'll only cost you $140. No, it's half off. <laughs> so you're gonna use the code on the hunt. O-N-T-H-E-H-U-N-T, -E no spaces, no capital letters, just on the hunt. That's your coupon code to use at checkout. And so um, that's a, a great deal. It's coming up for Christmas. If you've got a hunter in your family, get into it. Hey, Rick, anything you want to say before we close up? Well, yeah, actually, I, I mean, I'm astonished that you're offering that kind of a price. Listen, I've got, I've got the old Shasta Ridges and the new ones, and the new ones are phenomenal. And that price is as cheap as I've ever seen them. So if, you, you know, if you're thinking about binoculars, trust me. That's the buy of the buy of the year right there. All right, so this is on the hunt with Alpin. We're going to wrap it up. This is the pilot episode. We've had a few hiccups. We've had a couple of fun little things. We're going to get through it. We now know what we're going to have to work out with some technical difficulties. Uh, we're going to be doing this every Wednesday evening. It looks like, and it's going to be turned into an audio podcast. I'm Kent Martz. Mark Scrocky. And Rick White. For On the Hunt by Alpen. Everybody have a great week.